Since the pandemic began, more than a quarter of a million people in entertainment have filed for unemployment. Hollywood production is coming back with film permit applications up 40% in Los Angeles, but it's still a slow process. Tonight, we meet an actor currently working during COVID to talk about these changes. It's good to have you here. From Los Angeles, this is KLCS PBS. Welcome to Everybody with Angela Williamson, an innovation, arts, education, and public affairs program. Everybody with Angela Williamson is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. And now your host, Dr. Angela Williamson. Sean Catherine Kane, it's so good to have you here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, it's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, well, I grew up in Staten Island, New York, where a lot of my friends and family talk like this. Um, <laughs> luckily, I don't, <laughs> uh, so I can travel in wider circles. The, then uh, I studied um, acting at NYU's Tisch School of the Arts, and uh, I studied with the Atlantic Theater Company Acting School there, um, got my BFA in drama, and for some obscure reason was motivated to switch coasts <laughs> to uh, settle myself in Los Angeles, <clears throat> but I do still split my time between Los Angeles and New York, because my family and I are very close. Was it difficult for you to move from New York to California to pursue your dream? Well, I think it's always difficult to leave family when you're so tightly bound. Um, was, but luckily, I've been able to visit a lot, uh, except for in the last several months. Uh, but I usually go back about four times a year, sometimes for as long as a month, and get to spend time with my nieces and nephew. Um, so I, I make it work. But yes, of course, I miss them a lot. Um, fortunately, there have been a lot of opportunities that have softened the blow. Um, some things, that, projects that I was able to participate in here, community that I was able to find. Uh, you, you know the phrase, find your tribe. I definitely was able to build that sort of foundation and those contacts in Los Angeles that I don't think I necessarily would have had access to in New York. Now you talked about finding your tribe. Mm -hmm. Now did this <laughs> tribe help when you started to write and produce your own short films? Yes, <laughs> I think automatically you first lean on your friends um, and you lean on people that you've worked with already. Um, so just by Get, getting myself out there, meeting more people. Um, I was lucky enough to find representation pretty quickly. And um, through meeting more people, got recommendations to, well, take class here. Um, this is a really great venue for um, people who want to network and meet other creative minds. Um, and so I started to meet, pretty, meet people pretty frequently. And from there, um, admire the certain talents. Um, and get cast in things and admire those people's talents. And so when it came time for me to um, do the first one, which was, I had a lot of mistakes in it, <laughs> uh, I just tapped people that I felt I could trust and that I wanted to work with. And from there, uh, you, you definitely like, you have your hits and your misses, uh, uh, but you, you also learn so very much every single time you make an attempt. So I've been able to build and build not only my projects, but the, the foundations of respect that engender future projects. I want to talk about your acting in a minute, but you talked about your film. So let's talk about a, a little bit in detail. And you talked about, of course, with filmmakers, we all make mistakes, we look at those, but <laughs> you did really well with this film. So I want you to tell us a little bit about that film and tell us the exposure you got. So I wrote Safe uh, a couple of years ago, and it was initially sparked by participating in a, a film festival, collaboration uh, film festival, in which we as filmmakers all had to help each other. And it was a two week timeline. You're given a um, quotation at, at the start, a quote from whatever source, you don't know what it, it's, it's announced at the launch party. And you're given two weeks to write film and you know, cast, post-production, everything, and then submit your film. Some of the films get chosen to screen, some of the films win. And uh, I had had something on my mind for a while that I thought I would probably write, write about, but of course I needed the quote first. Um, 
And so, quote, help me out. <laughs> I, just, I wrote, I wound up writing the film I thought I was going to, and um, I was fortunate that uh, a director that I already knew was going to participate and uh, trusted him, and we put together a fantastic team. Uh, it, uh, that's one of those projects that I, oh, well, of course we can always grow and be better. Um, that's one of those projects I think was a lightning in a bottle sort of moment. Things fell into place, and I was really, really fortunate with how it was received. Do you think Safe was received because of the message? And I want you to tell us a little bit about the message of the movie. Sure. Um, well, I Safe deals with um, the 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 personal boundaries and personal safe space uh, in the male-female dynamic, um, and how it's frequently how the the unspoken messages are frequently misidentified and misinterpreted by both sides, but that the person who is then in danger is the female, um, and how navigating out of those situations is often as perplexing and damaging as the situations themselves. How, what lasting effects you can have after a series of really truly negative um, borderline violent encounters. And I was a very awkward kid and I didn't know what was going on. I, was, I had not, <laughs> I was so lost. But this boy started following me around the library and I got scared and I tried to tell someone and she was like, oh, it's cute, he has a crush on you. And I was like, no, I'm scared, he won't leave me alone. And he had a friend with him and then another friend. So now I had three boys following me around the library. And then they both, um, they all three of them, uh, all of a sudden out of nowhere hugged me and like wouldn't let go. And um, my, my babysitter was like still saying, oh, that's so cute, they liked you. But I felt so frightened and violated. And this is the messaging that we get. And I, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, I wasn't physically harmed, but it, it does scar your psyche as far as what your boundaries are allowed to be. And this film did phenomenal on the film festival circuit, but it also too, because you were the lead actress in the film, it strengthened you as an actor and I'm sure it opened up more jobs because I want you to tell us about this phenomenal training you're getting right now, right here in Los Angeles. Sure, um, well, well they say work begets work. And so, um, a lot of the people that saw SAFE um, asked me what I was working on next. Um, I've stayed in contact. Um, one of the people that saw that film uh, then cast me in another short film that did really, really well. It was a really beautiful film. Um, and uh, he and I, I think, are going to work again um, on my next, my next script. So that one was his. <laughs> okay, so you're still writing in producing your own films too while yes. you're do okay well definitely keep talking <laughs> yes yes um so he and i may uh hopefully if things go well in this in this sort of uncertain time hopefully we'll be filming in uh november december f my next script which is called stay and it's uh, that's the script that is currently making the rounds in some script competitions and um is moving into some rounds of really prestigious festivals that I didn't, I was very surprised. I got the letters and I was like, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> it's always a happy feeling, it's yeah. a happy feeling. Well, in right now, so you have a film in pre-production right now, we're just gonna say that's in pre-production yes, right now, stay. positive mm -hmm. thoughts. Mm -hmm. And a few weeks ago, you spent some time back on the set on a new movie. And so how was that for you as an actress? But you also have producer, filmmaker, writer in the background, but how is that for you? Yes, well, I keep those two parts of the brain very separate when on set. Um, on the days that I'm acting, it's, it's only acting, which is why it's really important to have a, a really strong team that you trust around you. To, like the director is doing the directing job, <laughs> the producers are doing the producing job. On that day, I'm not doing any of that. Can't do it, can't. Um, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so I, on this last production, uh, I was just an actor, just went on, uh, it, it was at the start of the day sort of fact finding about what the precautions would be, for, like research for my upcoming project. They were very, very careful um, to maintain social distancing and masks and um, have a skeleton crew. 
only essential people. Towards the latter part of the day, of course, as you're racing to get the shot, some of those social distancing uh, strictures get a little relaxed. But um, the testing was required and masks and the uh, everybody was as careful as they possibly could be. And it got shot, got done. So that was relief. <laughs> so tell us, you talked a little bit about yourself as an actress. Tell us about how you will approach producing Stay with the current pandemic. Um, well, I would love for, obviously, to be COVID compliant completely for, uh, for Stay. And I will have to do a little bit more research on that and what the uh, permitting is and what the what resources are needed because I was I was the recipient of it before um, with my producing partner and uh, I hope my hope is that we can continue to have productions um, come back and start filming again um, I'm looking at another job coming up where they're being very COVID compliant very careful everybody gets tested every morning um, and you get the quick test before you walk in so I'm hoping that we are able to slowly and safely um, recreate the robust production environment and community that we had before. That, that's the ultimate goal, um, if not more so. Maybe this will spark new creative stories uh, that frequently come out of times of, tr of turmoil and trouble. Um, I mean, without sounding like a nerd, <laughs> like the Chronicles of Narnia came out of World War II. So who knows what, what massive expression or outpouring ex of expression could come from what we're going through now, especially as many of us have been with our own thoughts more so than in the past. Tell us a little bit your hope for the future of Hollywood as an actress or as a filmmaker, even if you want to talk about both, that's good too. <laughs> well, my primary hope is that we can return to work with safely um, with hopefully no uh, no instances of new COVID cases um, because our precautions are effective. And if we accomplish that, then I hope that production will continue to grow and, and become as robust and rich as it was um, in the past with new series starting, perhaps inspired by what's been going on now. Um, and as an actor particularly, I would love for the shared intimacy of of that screen time and that shared expression when you feel like you and your scene partner are the only two people in the world. Um, but that's sort of impossible when you're six feet apart. <laughs> so I would love that to return. Thank you so much for everything that you are doing, not only as a filmmaker, but as an actress, and also just shedding some light today on production that's happening during COVID right now. Best of luck to you, and I can't wait to see you again on the big screen. Where's Tommy? I thought he was with you. No. Jack! Tommy? Oh. <laughs> Don't stop. Keep playing. from the Foundation for a Better Life. Wealth is a major indicator of economic inequality. Millions of families nationwide lack resources necessary to secure their financial futures. Tonight, we discuss wealth equality across various racial and ethnic groups. Sergio, tell me a little bit about where you come from because your background is what makes you Sergio today. Sure. So I want to go all the way back, if you don't mind. Not at all. So five generations ago uh, in Mexico, um, I had an ancestor, uh, a great-great-grandfather, who was a Huasteco indigenous man, okay? And he became a physician, and he became the physician of the, what became the president of Mexico, who, who could also be called a dictator, because he, he ran his term for 30 years. And, and he became a very important person in Mexico. And so what you see in me 
is actually the falling dagger of that family line, right? And so I had a whole series of, of individuals in my family that were very, very successful, very, very uh, important to a nation, right? Mm -hmm. And then when I was brought to this country at the age of three, I lost all of that social capital, right? And I grew up um, sort of in, in Orange County as a middle class, privileged, but um, nowhere near the level of privilege that I would have had had I stayed in Mexico City. And, and the reason why I'm telling you all this is because it's an important dynamic that is, is actually very unique. Typically, when people talk about Mexican immigration, they don't see somebody who's, who's falling mm -hmm. in social capital. They see somebody who has um, adopted what would be the American dream, and they think that they're going to go from the lowest of the possible um, social castes, if you will, mm -hmm. to something like middle class or beyond, right? And so um, I think it's important for me to, to come from that point of privilege and to say there, there's actually another path. Because you went, all, you went backwards. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Wow. And, and it's an important thing today because um, I don't think, for example, and this is uh, many, many generations later, I don't think I'll be as successful as my father was even. And I know I'll definitely not be as successful as my great-great-grandfather, right? And so that's sort of a, a dynamic that has led to why I do the work that I do is because I've sort of always felt uncomfortable um, in the United States from an immigrant perspective and, and also with, um, you would have to get into the dynamics of Orange County and what it's like to be a Mexican in Orange County and what it's like to be a, a, such a unique Mexican like I, I have been. And your background is as a venture capitalist. And we're going to talk about what you're doing now, but your background is so important to what you're doing today. So tell us a little bit about that. So my background is as a banker, and um, I've been working in venture capital for the last seven years. And venture capital is, is actually a pretty significantly large industry. And the, the part of it that I've been working on is what they call angel funding. And tell me about this angel funding and the reason why you think that there's inequality today. I'm not going to use the right words, but it's like a governing body for all angel capital in the United States. Okay. It's called the Angel Capital Association. And so what they do is they take all of these groups of angel investors and um, those investors provide data back to the Angel Capital Association and they release it to the public as something that's called the HALO report. And so just to give you an idea of the state of angel funding in the United States, when that data comes back, there's essentially four categories for individuals that are represented. The first is the white male. The second is the non-white male. The third is the white female. And the fourth is the non-white female. So there is nothing, of, like it, if you're black, if you're Latina, if you're Asian, you get lumped into a non-white female category, okay? And roughly, if you were to take all of 100% of angel fundings that happen in the United States, that non-white female is getting less than 3% of, of that 100%. And so then if you drill down into my specialty, which is Latinos or Latinas, they don't even get to a fraction of 1% of the, t of the angel fundings that are successful in a given year. But it's important to know that that's a reality, but nobody's even counting. You do not get accounted for as a Latina or as a black female, you just go into the non-white category. So they have one category for a large group of people, and then based on that category, which is really small, only a small, even a smaller percentage gets that capital. Yeah. 
So what can what have you been trying to do to help widen that gap? And I'm not putting you on the spot, <laughs> but I'm sure you have been doing something. I, I've been failing. I've been struggling, right? So um, typically what, what I have seen in my seven years in doing this is uh, white males come through the door with resources and with all of the things necessary to have their startups be funded. We don't typically see anything other than that. And so does that lead to why you are doing the nonprofit work that you're doing today? So to a certain extent. So the work that I'm doing in the nonprofit world today is tied to um, not to entrepreneurship the way that the venture capital industry sees it. Um, they call it social enterprise in the nonprofit world. And it's how are, would you, if you're an undocumented mother living in South Los Angeles, with all of the obstacles that you have in front of you to earn a living, how are you going to do it? And so that's what this work is about. And so what have you done to make sure that people get over these barriers? So it, it's not so much about me. I know that it should be about me, but I followed uh, an executive that, that I um, respect a lot. Her name is Dr. Michelle Burton. And she brought me into this very storied nonprofit in South Los Angeles that's called Community Health Councils. Community Health Councils was uh, established uh, during the, the last uh, uprising in 1992 as a part of a, an effort that was called Rebuild LA. And so Community Health Councils has a division that's called the Social Change Institute. And they produce a capacity building workshop that's called Leading for Equity. And so I was brought into Leading for Equity to be somebody who could facilitate that capacity building for this particular audience of, of mostly women. Right now what we see in, in the workshops that we've done to date, it's been about 80% are, are uh, Latinas and about 20% are about elder black women. And so that's been the makeup of, of this particular community in South Los Angeles. And so this is very personalized and you actually have to meet with each one of these candidates individually to come up with their stories. Absolutely. How difficult is that, especially with the amount of people that you're servicing right now? So that, that is actually one of the big problems. Um, right now we have about 50 participants in, in the workshop. And, and I actually tap my network um, from, from other industries to support them. Um, but yeah, so by our calculations, uh, the research that we've done at Community Health Councils, I estimate that there's about 250,000 of this particular type of person that could use that capacity building. We, we do get support. I think where the nonprofit world is, is very complicated is that usually they're funding programs and they're usually funding them at short term. And so what, what needs to happen at some point as, as you begin to show impact is you need to get multi-year funding and you need to um, have more funders, if you will. So a, a common problem in the nonprofit world. Is funding. Yeah, definitely understand that. And so I want to talk a little bit about your source material because sure. that was one of the major things that I was so impressed with. So tell us a little bit about that and tell us how you use that. And then you can even tell us how you developed it. Sure. So um, I gave you an idea of, of what the workshop looks like in terms of the individual identities, right? Mm -hmm. um, typically what ends up happening, at least in my world, especially in the world of venture capital, um, but this applies to almost every industry, including the media industry, which is that when you go to provide source material to those individuals, it's usually coming from the same place, and that same place is usually written by an adult white male. Typically, that, the best that you can hope for is an adult white male from Harvard. Like that is the, the creme de la creme 
of source material. And so what, what does end up happening a lot is that somebody will bring something in from the Harvard Business Review and they'll try to apply it at the street level with these types of individuals. And so that's the first thing that I saw, is that the source material that I was given does not apply to the types of individuals that I'm working with. And so what I really wanted to do was to create that source material so that the individual that I'm working with can see themselves in the source material. You have given us so much information, Sergio. People are watching right now and they want to know how they can get in contact with you to help you continue your service in the community. So can you give us a little information about that? Sure, so once again, the organization that I'm doing this for is called Community Health Councils. They have a website. It's chc-inc.org. And there's a section on the website for the Social Change Institute. And then there's a, a call out, what we call it, um, for this particular program that's called Leading for Equity. And you, you mentioned that you have funders and people volunteering, but there's more that can always be needed, right? Absolutely. And I th one of the things that I wanted to try to express is that even if you get a program funded, like let's say you have a program that's for 50 individuals, you can get that program funded. Like it's still hard, but it's, it's possible. What there is no funding for is for going from 50 to 250,000, right? The scale of something that, that doesn't provide a return on investment that, that like an investor would be able to calculate, right? And so, you know, one thing is, you know, struggling to get the funding for a specific program and another thing is, is uh, struggling to get the funding for the scale of that particular program. And so it sounds like what you're trying to do is really bridge a gap with who's the writer versus who is the audience. That's right. Excellent. Oh, Sergio, thank you so much for your time and telling us a little bit about your background and how it's led you to be this champion, and that's what I consider you right now, a champion <laughs> for people bringing equity to all humankind. So thank you so much for your time tonight. For sure. And thank you for joining us on Everybody with Angela Williamson. It's viewers like you that make this show possible. Stay in touch with us on social media. Good night and stay well. Thank you.